Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I'm your host, Ted Harrington. And with me here today is my special guest, Luther Miller. Luther, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Ted. It's great to be here. Yeah, man. So uh, Luther is the CIO and CTO of a company called Action Face. And what they're doing is it's pretty cool. It straddles the, the digital world and the physical world. And that's, that's one of the things that definitely I want to talk about here later today as we get into this. Uh, but before we talk about actually that straddle, because that, that is a really interesting topic, I wanted to explore a transition that you've gone through in your own professional life, in your career, that I think a lot of members of our listeners, of our audience, have either maybe gone through themselves or have considered going through or are maybe one day hoping to go through or even if they don't want to go through it, they're probably going to be asked to do it. Uh, you've, you've transitioned at one point from consulting into being in-house in this uh, engineering and technical leadership capacity. Can you tell me about that and, and why did you do that? And just give us a little background on the transition. Yeah, absolutely. So I started my career in consulting and technology consulting and then continued in that path for a couple decades. Um, and I really enjoyed consulting for a number of reasons. Um, I've always enjoyed solving problems, uh, especially with technology, software development and you know working with uh, software teams, overseeing their work, helping clients solve problems. One of the other great things about consulting uh, is the variety of work. And so I worked with a, uh, a professional services firm uh, right out of college and then um, worked for a couple others over the years of different sizes. <clears throat> and I've worked with a lot of different Fortune 500 companies as customers and being able to see different businesses, different departments within businesses and how they function, what kind of challenges they have. I found that super interesting, um, that, that pace of change that consulting uh, gives me. Um, but at the same time, I always felt like uh, I'm solving someone else's problems for another company. And in the back of my mind, I always had that itch to be part of a company where I'm working on the problems for that company. Um, and the, the opportunity to be an entrepreneur is uh, super exciting to me. And you get a lot of that entrepreneurial experience at a consulting firm. You can help that consulting firm grow and so forth but it's definitely very different to be working on your own product that you're bringing to the market as opposed to uh, someone else's product when you're, when you're growing a professional services firm. I would imagine that many of the lessons that you learned in your life as a consultant are directly transferable to now being in-house. If you, if you had to pick one, well, I guess let me first ask whether or not that's true. And if it's not true, then tell me that, but assuming it's true, um, what would you say or the, is one of the major things that you've been able to carry over? Great question. Wow, there are probably so many. Um, <clears throat> in, in consulting and scaling different consulting businesses, so one company I joined, I was the third employee, and then we grew it to a couple dozen people. So that was a very small company. But even that small amount of growth, as we grew the company, we had to mature our processes internally. And then when I was at a company called Pariveda Solutions, um, that company was, I think, around 500 people or so when I left, uh, 600 people. And so that was a you know, mid-sized organization. And that also had a different level of need for maturity of process. And so I think a valuable lesson uh, for me that's been very transferable is understanding the level of maturity that you need uh, for different objectives at different stages of a company size. And so at Action Face, we're at a smaller size right now, but when we close a round of funding, um, we'll definitely need to do a lot of hiring and grow the company. And then of course, in the future, we'll be even bigger. And so I'm constantly thinking about what is the level of maturity that we have now for certain processes, like say interviewing people, and what's the level of maturity that we're going to need in a year from now, two years from now, and so forth. Great. So that's really interesting the way you're talking about this idea that different objectives require different levels of, or, or I guess different levels of maturity require you to think about different problems in different ways. Um, as a company grows, and you gave a good example of how you're 
going to go through a transition from currently a smaller organization to an inflection point to a larger organization once funding happens. That's, I think, something that a lot of our audience either already has gone through or will go through. How do you identify that the conditions around maturity and the objective and how to approach them, those things have changed. How do you identify that? You know, part of it is awareness. <clears throat> Having lived through other companies where we focused on knowing that we need to have processes in, in place to make things repeatable. Um, just having that awareness is part of it for sure, because someone who's maybe fresh in their career might not have that awareness yet and everything is experiential to them. So they did something once and it worked out well. And so the next time that problem comes along, they just maybe do the same thing that they did the first time without really thinking about what is it that they're doing? What are those steps? And so that's part of it, knowing that you want to get from a stage where things are maybe just experiential to repeatable and figuring out how to make them repeatable. And people will talk about um, different stages of maturity for different things like uh, with models like crawl, walk, run. You know, we have to be able to crawl before we can walk and run before we can uh, and, and walk before we can run. And so translating that into things that we're doing today is really important. So scalability, for example, um, at our stage, Right now, it was super important that we first proved that our core technology can work. And then after that, it became important to automate the technology and, and then integrate it into other parts of our uh, customer experience pipeline. And now that we've done those things, we're looking forward and we're knowing that we're going to need to be able to scale that up when a lot of users come into our experience at the same time. And so things that we were doing yesterday um, that were important for the business are not the same things that are going to be important for tomorrow. And understanding what those things are and how we may need to think about some of our software stack differently for scalability versus just to prove that the technology works um, is, is an important part of that. Yeah, that's really fascinating thinking about the idea of how as the company grows and matures, the, the needs change and you can, it's, I guess, goals aren't just set it and forget it, right? You have to revisit it periodically. And you're, you're sort of triggering a few thoughts in my mind about even things that are going on in our company where we're working on something today. And it's like, oh yeah, this is actually different than the way we approached it a year ago. And maybe, maybe it's even already different and we haven't adapted yet. Um, is there any advice that you give to, well, to me, because I'm asking that question, <laughs> but you know, to anyone listening who is wondering about parts of their own process where they maybe don't realize yet they, they have not yet leveled up their approach to it. So, you, I mean, you use the example of first you have to prove it, then you have to automate it. And, and maybe there's people listening to this, like, am I at the point of, I should automate this thing? How do we think about evaluating those processes? That's a great question. You know, I had a colleague a, a few years ago who was helping me think through a particular problem and said, think of it in terms of bookends. And so let's take an example of, um, you know, part of Action Faces system is we have all of these assets. And when I say assets, I mean different poses, like body styles, we call them. Uh, where you can have your action figure playing basketball or playing soccer, things like that, and different hairstyles. Um, those are all assets. <clears throat> and as we grow the number of assets we have, and then we also add this other dimension of having customized assets for different groups. Um, so different schools, for example, that have different school colors and different names on the, uh, on the bodies. So if you go to... Uh, you know, let's just say some high school, uh, we'll call it Berkeley High School, right? You know, what are the Berkeley High School colors and the Berkeley High School name? That number of assets is increasing. And when we add something in one dimension, we have to fill out the other dimensions. So if we add a new school, we have to add uh, assets for that school across all of the asset types, all the different poses, for example. But if we add a new pose, we have to make sure we add all of the assets for the existing schools that we had already customized for. And so as we, as we keep increasing the volume and scale of what we're doing, um, the manual processes that we were using in the past 
uh, become more and more cumbersome. So the first warning sign is like, oof, man, I just spent a lot of hours doing this thing that should be really simple and was really simple. It wasn't a problem in the past because we didn't do too much of it, but now we're doing more and more of it. And so one extreme end of the bookend is, okay, we have like a minimum way we can spend some manual time with a bunch of command line tools getting something to work. The other end of the bookend is, man, wouldn't it be nice if our designers could just click a button and push a new asset out and all this stuff just happened automatically, right? And now it becomes a question of how do I fill in the different steps from one bookend to the other uh, and plot out a path where we can make progress on this and each step is helping us get to that end state and not sort of a distraction away from that end state. So that's, that's how I think about it in terms of bookends. Yeah, that's, that's a cool way to think about and organize the thought. And, you know, I'm even just, I'm, again, I'm, I'm totally inserting myself into your story right now, but I'm like thinking <laughs> about our own challenges and do, do we, do we pause long enough to say, you know, what are the bookends for this? So I'm definitely going to chew on that. that. That's a super cool idea. Um, you know, you were talking about this idea of, of your assets uh, at your organization and, you know, what you guys do for people who haven't heard of Action Face, you, you basically help people create these custom uh, figurines and maybe there's a different word for it than that, but they're really cool looking. I can't wait to get mine. Um, super excited about it. He's going to have wild hair and he's going <laughs> to be slam dunking a basketball or something. But um, so what you guys do is it's really interesting to me whenever I'm talking to a tech company who's sort of bridging the physical and digital realms, which is certainly what you're doing. You have software that makes physical things. Can you tell us about how you approach the challenges? Like in my mind, I almost think of, uh, you know, those, those famous places in like Africa or wherever where two oceans meet and it's two different colors and temperatures of water. And those two oceans are kind of like, you know, one ocean is the digital world, one's the physical world, and you have to deal with like crossing those two. So how do you, how do you approach this? It is really interesting. And, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. And so I keep reading that supposedly I straddle between boomers and, and Gen Z. And I think that that's in some ways an analogy to this, you know, physical and digital world. Um, and to, to illustrate that a little bit more, you know, maybe 15 years ago, um, when my first kid was born, we started, you know, buying toys for the kids, right? And you've got these physical things and it feels like if I'm going to spend money on something, I want to have something for it physically. Mm -hmm. And then at some point we hit this, uh, milestone where the kids started asking for in-app purchases, right? And I'm like, oh, geez, I don't, I don't know about that. And in-app purchase, I'm going to spend money and there's no physical thing that anyone has afterwards. Where does that go? And then I kind of realized, well, that's maybe in some ways that's better than accumulating, you know, more and more junk that ends up eventually in a landfill. Um, it still provides value through entertainment and experience. Um, you know, it, it puts people to work because they're creating those digital assets. Uh, so it's part of an economy. And so it's real in that way. And I think that helped me change my mental model around what digital versus physical can be in terms of having value. And how that translates to our business <clears throat> is also really interesting to me. Um, I've worked with customers that are, are pure digital, um, companies that you know, do uh, software products and, uh, and software as a service type products. I've worked with companies that are pure physical where you, know, you go to a store and you buy clothes off the rack. And I've seen sort of both of those worlds. What we want to do is create an immersive experience that combines both. We don't want to just have a physical good as a product. We want to have an immersive experience that's really fun to do as part of that experience. And part of the value in the experience, uh, a lot of customers might never even get to the physical product. They might just do something really fun in the digital experience and share that on social media because um, it looks cool you know, and, and get something out of it that way. So it's an engaging digital experience that flows right into a physical experience. And there's so many things that we can do down the road that could include both. Um, the founder of Action Face and uh, actually a couple of our founders from Action Face both worked on a product called Skylanders, which also bridged this physical and digital world. Um, and so uh, there's, there's some background there too in our company. Wow, that's pretty cool. 
Now, I would imagine that when you're talking about bridging the physical and digital worlds that introduces some some barriers and some constraints that if you are purely operating in a digital realm, you wouldn't otherwise have to face. And certainly one thing is you have to, to fulfill a physical item that has to have material sourced from somewhere, fabrication has to happen somewhere, there's physical shipping, boxes, all this stuff. How have you approach that end of the challenge like because you're you are a tech company but you also are a product fulfillment um and those can be in conflict in some cases how have you thought about resolving that yeah absolutely i mean that is a tension we do have to think about uh hey we could add this neat new feature that'll help the digital experience but does it really further our physical experience <clears throat> uh, or we could spend time focusing on hey it would be neat if we had uh, something enhanced in the physical experience. So you get this physical, you know, figurine uh, in the mail, and I don't know if this is going to show up on my Zoom with the virtual camera, but I'll try it. Um, when you open that box, what should that physical experience be, right? And we spend time on that, um, and we've thought about how we can enhance that. So maybe there's an environment that comes with the physical figurine. Um, if that environment was customized, like say a, a custom photo or something like that, that you wanted to have that was different than someone else's custom photo that came with their figurine. Now we have a fulfillment problem where we have to match those things up as they come off of uh, manufacturing. At the same time, we are leveraging some of the latest and greatest technology for the physical experience. Uh, so we're able to do these full color uh, 3D printouts that are completely custom for each person, as opposed to doing mass manufacturing of just a single product by itself. Um, another, another place that that uh, comes into play is that we have extra steps that we have to do in our pipeline to be able to make the physical product. If it stopped at just the digital product, then like a video game, you have this 3D object in the game, which is basically an empty shell. You know, there's a, there's a surface that you see that reflects light. The graphics card figures out how to do that and make it look really cool. It looks like a person, but it's not. It's just this uh, representation in a, in, in a 3D graphic space. To be able to do a 3D printable version of this, there's so much knowledge that goes into uh, how 3D printing works and what makes a good 3D print and a bad 3D print and a lot of extra uh, proprietary work that we've done to go from this sort of empty shell into something that does meet the needs of a 3D printer. Yeah, makes sense all these uh, different conditions and constraints that you have to think about. That's, uh, that's pretty fascinating. Now, it, it sounds like where you guys are in the stage of, of development of the, I don't mean development, but stage of growth in the company is, you know, preparing for, um, you know, funding. And so you're an early stage of the company. And there are some unique challenges at that end of, of the spectrum. Um, how have you guys thought about the, uh, the challenge around uh, just resource constraint? I mean, any company that's in that early, early stages, not enough money, not enough people, not enough time, not enough, just nitpick the resource, <laughs> don't have enough of it. How, how do you approach those constraints? Yeah, you know, it comes down to understanding our objectives at any given moment. And, and what we really need to focus on to reach that next milestone. And then from there, that helps us, um, that, that's, a, that's a basic, uh, that's our context, a basis for our decision-making. Interestingly, you know, we have so many ideas and things that we wanna do in the future. So we've, we have this backlog of things that we wanna do and it's, it's really long. We just spent uh, over the last week, two different, probably three to four hour long meetings discussing every item and you know what its priority is in our current state. And, and as we start executing on each of those items that we have priority on, we do have to keep in mind that longer term vision because we don't wanna do something uh, that's not gonna fit that longer term vision or do something in a way that's gonna create a lot of extra work down the road. But at the same time, we do have to find that balance uh, and resolve that tension of we need to, to get X, Y, Z out the door as soon as possible and so sometimes that does mean doing it differently than we would do it if we had, you know, two years to do it or all the resources in the world. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to being um, uh, very uh, selective about exactly what we're going to do and when we're going to do it, yeah. and and knowing what gaps we're maybe leaving in the in the meantime. 
one of the elements to what you just described was this idea that you want to do things today that aren't going to cause a whole pain in the butt in terms of effort later. My words, not yours, but that, you know, that was the idea <laughs> that you described. Um, and I, I, as a security professional, I see that that situation exists all the time, but people make the opposite decision and often unwittingly, right? Well, they're, they don't realize that um, a security flaw that's say introduced around the design stage or early stages of the development of the solution, they don't deal with it then, and th but they deal with it later, which is what most people plan to do. Then it's like astronomically more difficult to fix it and one of the things that I'm always uh, interested in figuring out how to do better is how to better advocate for that, better articulate to engineering leaders to say like, hey, I know this is the thing that sounds like it's farther off, but you have to do it now in this way so that it isn't a nightmare for you later. What would the advice be from your viewpoint of how to help people like yourself uh, think differently about that particular situation? Wow, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you're spot on there. And I think my sense would be that you could probably convince the engineering teams of its importance more easily than maybe some of the other folks in the company, right? And so part of my role as the CIO is to know what some of those, I'll call them non-functional requirements. Some of those requirements are that we need to have in place right from day one um, that might not be visible features to an end user uh, right from day one. And I need to be able to articulate those to our CEO and other members of the business so that they understand why they're important and why we're working on some of those things when we could be working on something that a user might see as furthering our product. And so security, um, security and privacy are great examples of that. Understanding where we absolutely can't uh, sacrifice that in, in the short term um, is important. And so what is the, the minimum that we need to do around security and privacy? And I don't mean it in terms of a minimum, like we're not doing things we should be doing. I mean, what is the minimum that we should, should do? What's and then TLC? what are some things that we would like to be able to do later? Right. <clears throat> so uh, having uh, more automated systems to, to do penetration testing, and alerting us of uh, maybe you know libraries somewhere that might be uh, out of date or you know third-party libraries that might have um, vulnerabilities, things like that. Uh, that kind of automation is something that could maybe hold off a little bit longer, but securing uh, our connections to our databases, securing our accounts to our cloud, two-factor authentication, making sure customer data is encrypted. Um, all of those kinds of things are really important right from day one. You know, we can't, we can't launch anything that customers are going to use without that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hey, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I totally <laughs> agree with you on that. Um, but it is often seen by organizations as not quite the way that you described it. And, and I love that term that you use, you know, referring to it as a non-functional requirements, you know, things that are uh, necessary from day one even if it's not necessarily visible to the customer right away. So that's, that's a really cool idea to hear. I'm going to noodle on how to, uh, how to think differently about that idea. So, um, which by the way, like <laughs> part of running a podcast is I just get to ask people the questions <laughs> that I, I want advice on. So thank you for that. Now, when you think about what's sort of uh, coming around the corner in terms of the way that companies are adapting the way they even build software solutions. What's your take on that? I mean, there's all kinds of debates going on all the time about what's the best methodology and, you know, how should we be thinking about continuous this or integrated that? And I'm curious from your seat, how are things changing and what do you think is changing next? Yeah, there's this constant tension between, you know, what can we do today that has immediate visible impact and what can we what can we build today that's part of our, our process and infrastructure, infrastructure that helps us go faster tomorrow, right? Um, I always think about that line in uh, one of the Cars movies, um, you have to turn right to turn left or something like that, right? <laughs> I can't remember exactly what the line is. And so sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. And 
and, you know, this asset management thing is a great example of that where we could just keep putting that off and working on other features, but then every time we have to deal with that asset management problem of, uh, of creating, you know, adding new assets and updating new assets, then that slows down some valuable time from, you know, folks that could be spending that time elsewhere. So if we step back now and invest more time in maturing that platform, then we'll be spending less time on that problem going forward so we can focus on other problems, right? So figuring out when it's time to step back and, um, and, and make something better so that you can go faster in the future, whether it's automating your, your pipeline for, uh, for, for builds for your iOS app or deployments to your website, um, you know, implementing CI, CD, whether it's uh, automating some things you're doing in the cloud, it's all part of that question. And it's a constant tension that we all feel. So th the best thing to do is to recognize it. You know, what is the tension? What, what are the things that we think we need to mature? And what is the cost of not maturing them going to be uh, down the road? And then what are we putting off by doing that? So if you understand all of those variables, then you can at least make informed decisions about when you're going to do something or not do something. Yeah, it's funny. We have a uh, software development capability in, in our company, and uh, one of our, uh, a few of the members of the dev team were giving this really interesting internal talk the other day. And I love the way they talked about this idea that they're like, once a human touches a thing once, we never want to touch it again. We want to automate it immediately. And I'm like, that's, that's such a cool way to think about things. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be able to do that and automate everything. But having that mindset of, because it's exactly what you're saying, like, what can we do today that'll make us faster tomorrow? And that's the like, what can I automate for tomorrow? It means I have to do the work today. Um, that That's pretty cool, though. And it seems to be echoing some of the things that you're saying. Definitely. At the same time, though, um, you know, there's a list of maybe 150 things like that that we want to do. And uh, the hard part is recognizing which one of those 150 things uh, needs to be done today. That's one way to look at it. I had a, a client of mine a few years ago tell me that the hardest part of his day was deciding what he wasn't going to do, right? Mm -hmm. So which of those 149 things are you not going to do uh, over the next couple hours or the next day? Uh, making that decision can be hard. But if you've set that business context for the, the top of the decision-making tree, you know what goals do we have over the next week, over the next month, over the next quarter, um, that will help inform those decisions. How do you make that decision, deciding what to do today and what not to do today? Well, if we've done all of the legwork and, and we have the list of things that, that needs to be done um, and we understand what the priorities are, then it often comes down to picking the first priority off the list. Uh, although as, a, as an engineering leader, I also have uh, several teams reporting up to me. And so I'm constantly getting pinged for, you know, oh, something came up or what do you think about this? Or can you test this new thing? You know, so there's a lot of interruptions in my day also. <laughs> so in between interruptions, I'm trying to pick out what are the things I can do that, that add the most value. Yeah, I totally feel you on that. It's funny how, you know, you'll start a day or a week or whatever saying like, okay, these are the five things that need to be done today. And it's like, by the end of the day, maybe you started number one. <laughs> and that, that's right. a real challenge. I mean, it sounds yeah. like I'm being cavalier about priorities, but I, I think that a lot of people certainly, certainly struggle with that and struggle with what you're saying too getting uh, interrupted and re-diverted. Yep. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, as our, uh, our time here wraps up, uh, is there anything else that you think we should talk about in the, in the world of where this, this idea of the intersection of the physical world and the digital world and how do we make them work together? Like, where's that going? And what do you want to leave our audience with? You know, the more ways we can create seamless experiences going from one to the other, I think um, it just enhances our lives in general, right? Uh, everything from, I think we've seen a lot of digitization happening over the last year during the pandemic because people could no longer go uh, to places in person that they were able to go to before, whether it's, you know, maybe government bureaucracy needs to be digitized or something else. And so it's important to, to constantly think about how we can bridge the, the physical and digital together and make seamless experiences for the customer. 
I love it. Such good advice. Luther Miller, CIO and CTO of Action Face. Thanks so much for being on the show, man. Thanks, Ted. And it's actionface.me for anyone who's looking for the URL. <laughs> Very cool, man. Very cool. And uh, for everybody else, if you want to know more about this episode or others or request to appear on the show, just head over to tedharrington.com backslash podcast, and we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.